Rose and get settled. Anybody got anything they want to yak about on this fine Christmas morning? Yes, sir. Shoot. What did you really expect? Anything different? It's all inadvertent and um, uh, uh, not not suspect. So yeah. There you go. That's right. That's right. He's in charge. He wants us to suffer through uh, such leaders. Well, that's uh, the cross we bear. Yes, we bear the cross. Yes, we do. Yes, sometimes heavily. Yes, that's true. Yes, ma'am. Where do the Jewish people think they go after they die? Nowhere. Where? Great. Right. Uh, it it has it has taken uh, quite a long time, uh, but over the centuries, the Jews really came to a realization or an understanding, if you will, that um, the uh, the only thing eternal uh, is God, and we are not. And so their, their big push always, and the reason for their uh, being, if you will, uh, whatever, is not so much um, eternal or, or after, death, after life. It is this, it is, is this life. And yeah, and, and to be, and you know, uh, I guess you could say. And this is, this is kind of the way they look at it. They, they look at Christianity, for example, and lots of other religions, and they say, well, you, the only reason you guys are being good is for the reward you get. For, for you know, for, you, you, you go to heaven, okay? You're, you're, not, you're not being good for God, which that's not true, but to them, that's what it looks like. So it, it looks like to them, whether you're, whether you're a, a, a Buddhist or a or a, a Muslim, or, or whatever you are, you, you're 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 going for a payoff. You know, you're going for a reward. You're going for something uh, after this life, and and they think that's that's wrong. So they, they think that's selfish, and and so uh, they would they they're, and I'm, you know, I'm encapsulating a lot of <laughs> a lot of Jewish thought. There there's there's various colorations of this. From the very liberal reformed all the way over to the very conservative orthodox Hasidim, you know, kind. But anyway, um, the idea is giving glory to God, not yourself. And the idea is doing what God told you to do simply because God told you to do it, and keeping commandments uh, so that uh, um, you uh, you have a, a you have a good life. Uh, you can have a good life. You can be rich, as many of them are. Uh, you can be uh, happy, as they are. Watch Fiddler on the Roof, you know, they, they're having parties, you know, and, and enjoying life uh, and all that. Um, so the, the, the law, the traditions of the law, their other uh, rituals and traditions that have, they have accumulated over the centuries, uh, that's, that's their reason for living, really. And, and, and the afterlife really doesn't enter into the picture anymore. Uh, probably hasn't even before Christ uh, for a lot of them. Like for the Sadducees, for example, the whole Levite clan, uh, they did not believe in the resurrection. And they did not believe in the resurrection hundreds of years before Christ. Um, uh, they were influenced by Greek thought uh, quite a bit. And... and uh, while some Greek philosophers believed in an afterlife, a lot of them didn't. And uh, the Jews saw that as uh, uh, preferential. They saw that as preferential. And, and so in a way, uh, this, you, you cannot, you, if you're going to evangelize uh, Jews, uh, if you're going to 
do outreach uh, for, for Jews, the, f- the first thing you have to overcome is this idea uh, that the soul is not eternal and that you don't go on forever. That, that, because, it, because if you don't overcome that or if you don't at least try to persuade them that or, or, or you know, give them some evidence for it, you know, that they're, they're not interested because there's no, there's no payoff. It's like, it's like a, a lot of uh, religions today, uh, in, even within Christianity, like ELCA Lutherans, for example. Um, you know, they, they too, they don't believe in an immortal soul. They believe God is eternal, uh, but that's it. And so again, how are you going to, there's no payoff, you know, there's no reward, there's no punishment then either. There's no, hell, and, and, and this too, uh, you have to understand too with Jews uh, and, and these liberal Christians, you, you, it's, impossible, it's impossible to create any fear in them. They're not afraid. They're not. They're not afraid because there's no hell. There's no judgment. There's no hell. Uh, and and so there's no hell. There's no heaven. There's no immortal soul. You know, it doesn't matter what they really what they do, and uh, give the conservative and the Orthodox Jews credit at least for you know trying to live according to God's law. You know, the liberal Christians they don't bother with that. They, they make up the law as they go along. They, they keep the human law, whatever that happens to be at the moment. Um, and that's about it. So, yeah, it, 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 uh, it was something that was spooking around in Jesus' day, and he had to deal with, you know, his, his uh, discussions with the Sadducees, you know, about the resurrection and, you know, uh, that kind of thing, that, 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 uh, that the question that he gave them or they gave him, you know, about a guy who's married to, uh, you know, a bunch of different, or a woman that's married to a bunch of different guys, you know, which one is her husband and the resurrection and all that. They, they did that because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And, and uh, so he had to deal with that. Uh, it was already quite prevalent in his day. And what happened then, once, once you, then you lose the temple and, and you lose the, the, the Jerusalem and you lose the rest of Israel and you're thrown out, out into the world and you have no, you have no homeland anymore, what else is there? You know, well, what else is there? There's just keeping the law, keeping the traditions, and keeping the customs, and keeping the culture alive. That, that's it. That's all you got. And so they take it with them wherever they go, and that's their life. And afterwards, psh, nothing. So, yeah. Uh, very tough. Very, very, hard to, uh, very hard to evangelize uh, those, those people. Very, very hard. Very difficult. Anything else? Yes, sir. I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, saying in the election where Nixon lost because of the vote in Chicago and the state of Illinois. Mm, partly, and, yeah. And supposedly there was a debate amongst the Republicans in that time. A lot of them wanted to have a recap. No, they said, mm-hmm. and the diver, he said, no, no, no. He said, I don't want to read right. Oh, shut up. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. He supposedly said, we just weren't smart enough or fast enough. They do it. We do it. This time we kind of lost it. And that's all. Now, I don't know if that was the truth. Uh, that's, that, uh, no, that, that's not exactly what he said, but it, it, it's close enough. It, it's close enough. I think we lost that ability anymore in the politics. Well, you know, as 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 I pointed out numerous times, and if you've been listening to me over the last twenty five years, you you've heard what I've said. Uh, there hasn't been a truly uh, fair uh, election in the United States probably since. 1800, maybe even before that, but but at least 1800. Uh, uh, you can find a lot of irregularities um, all throughout the 1800s. Um, uh, Lincoln's election uh, was a lot of irregularities there. Um, Chester Arthur, uh, McKinley, um, Taft, I mean, 
You, you, can, you don't have to look real hard. You don't, you don't have to dig real deep. Some, maybe one or two of them you do, you know, but, but for the most part, you don't have to. And the same goes with governors, the same goes with, uh, with, with representatives, congresspeople. And, you know, Davy Crockett complained about uh, people uh, uh, stealing his election. He got elected to Congress and was reelected. And when he, and he bucked his party, he bucked the party. And so they made sure that he lost the next one. And uh, he said it was rigged, which I think it was. Uh, so you know, it's, it, 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 as far as as far as the United States goes, and, and as far as our uh, so-called democracy or representative uh, government and all that, um, it it is it is a little better maybe than uh, some systems. Uh, India maybe uh, their parliament's pretty corrupt. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it's not it's not really all that much better. Uh, and it's full of uh, shenanigans uh, of all kinds, from electing dog catcher all the way to the President of the United States. That's just the way it is, folks. That's just the way it is. And it doesn't mean that, that we uh, don't participate necessarily. It doesn't mean that we, that we uh, give up or anything. It doesn't mean that we don't get involved in politics, perhaps, if we want to do that. But I think as uh, Christians, uh, or if we do want to get involved in politics, if we do want to run for office, let's say, or if we do want to be part of a political uh, situation, you know, maybe a, a, a run, help run a party uh, or, or a campaign or whatever like that, we should do so understanding that um, it, it's not a matter of counting uh, ballots. It's not a matter of counting pieces of paper. It's not a matter of who checks what box. It's, it's a matter of what God wants. And, and for whatever reason, whether we understand it or not, God wants a certain person in a certain place and in a certain position. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it may be hard for us. I, it was very hard for my father as a personal friend of Dick Nixon. Uh, it was very hard uh, to, to uh, uh, kind of give up and give in uh, on that um, with, uh, with the Kennedy election in 60. Uh, it was very hard. And and uh, he, you know, he he didn't want to. Uh, he he and, and other people in the party, my grandfather especially, uh, really wanted Dick to to uh, fight it. You know, and and they they felt very confident that they could uh, win. They they felt very confident that uh, Mayor Daley in Chicago had dug up all kinds of dead people. Uh, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we're not talking we're not talking a couple dozen people. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names. We're talking thousands of ballots. Uh, that uh, Mayor Daley dug up for uh, for Kennedy, um, and and you know th this is historic record now. We know that looking back, uh, we, people have done plenty of research on it. Um, but you're right, it, it, Dick basically said no, um, and he knew he was a good historian. Dick Nixon was a very, very smart man and a very good historian, and he knew he he knew there were plenty of crooked elections down through the centuries in, in American history and, and other countries too for that matter. He knew that. And, and so he said, well, well, like you say, maybe sometimes the other side plays the game better than you do. And then maybe in the future you play the game better than they do. You know, I, I, I think uh, if, if the Hillary Clinton people had any, even the slightest thought for one second that uh, Trump would gather that many votes back in 2016, if they thought for a second that that would happen, they would have been prepared. And they would have stole that election just fine. And, and I mean, it wouldn't, even have, it wouldn't even have looked as close as it did. It, it wouldn't even have been a problem. He, he, he would have lost and there would be nothing, nothing to say about it. Nothing to say about it. Not, even, not nearly as close as 2020. But you see, they... They believed the polls, they believed their own people, they looked at the guy and they said, nobody's going to vote for that guy. Are you kidding me? The orange hair, and just, you know, wacky, you know, can't tie a tie, his ties are down here, you know. And, Come on, who's going to vote? Nobody's going to vote for that guy. And, and so they, they didn't set anything up. They, they, weren't, they weren't ready with pre-printed ballots. They weren't ready. You know, with you know, what whatever their plot has been over the years, or maybe a new one, who knows? But but they they just weren't ready. 
They weren't. They were. They weren't ready. They got. They got. They got surprised. They got. They got taken. Taken by surprise. That's 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 the only reason he won. That's it, because they're and they didn't play the game. They thought they didn't need to. Well, you see what happened after four years. Uh, 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 we learned our lesson by George. We're not going to let that happen again. So, okay, that, that's the way it goes. So again, uh, uh, find get in, get involved. I was very involved as chairman of the Young Republicans in Arizona. Um, ran a couple of worked in a couple of campaigns and everything, but. Uh, as a historian already, as a teenager, and uh, watching what went on in, in history um, and understanding uh, God's control, um, you know, when, when you win, you win, and you enjoy it, and you party hardy, and when you lose, eh, you know, you pack up your bags and eh, wait till next time. Yeah, and, and that's it. That's, that's the way it is. So, yeah, doesn't bother me. All right, question of the day. Um, you know, we celebrate today, of course, the fact that God became man, Emmanuel, God with us, right? This is uh, known in theology as the doctrine of the two natures, the two natures of Christ. And um, I don't think a lot of Christians, uh, even Lutheran Christians, even people who are used to things like catechism and, and Book of Concord and, and that kind of thing, I, I don't think they, they give it a whole lot of thought. They, they just think, okay, it's 100% man, 100% God in one person. That's it. That's the two natures. Yeah, there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it than that. And what you, what you need to know, okay, what you need to know is that our, um, our, our dear brothers and sisters in faith, but our opponents in doctrine, uh, both the Reformed and the Roman, and both sides of the Reformed, both the Calvinists and the Armenians, okay, so all three groups, if you want to separate them up into three groups, all, all three groups reject what's called a portion of the two natures, what's called the communication. of attributes. They reject that. They reject the communication of attributes. So even though God and man are in one person, and that's undivided, as the Athanasian Nicene Apostles' Creed teaches us, they would say there's no, there's no communication, there's no co-mingling of attributes. The, the attributes of man stay on the man side. The attributes of God stay on the God side. And so what you get with, with, with these, these, these groups, which this, you put, put all those together, uh, and, and, that's, and I would say liberal Lutherans too, for that matter. But, but you put all those together, that's a huge chunk of Christianity, uh, maybe, oh, maybe 75% of Christianity would reject uh, the communication of attributes. So, if, if we get into a discussion, and, and this, this affects things like the real presence in the Lord's Supper, okay? Uh, this affects uh, the omnipresence of God, like wherever two or three are gathered. Um, I'll ask you a question. God, uh, Jesus, the second member of the Trinity is in this room right now. Correct? Correct. All right. In what form? Careful. Careful. Because he's always God and man. We don't see that here, but we just don't see it. But how is he here? How is Jesus here, and how is Jesus, how is Jesus in that Lord's Supper here, and how is Jesus in the Lord's Supper at Grace Tucson? Because he's in us. Mm, no. Isn't there something called omnipresence? Yeah, right. Omnipresence applies to his nature as God. Does the omnipresence of Jesus' nature as God affect his human nature. See, that's the question, isn't it? 
Or let me put it to you a little simpler, maybe, I think, I hope. <laughs> Can the finite, that which is finite, contain the infinite? And can the infinite participate in the finite? See, these people would say no. The, they would say the, the infinite cannot commingle with the finite, and the finite cannot absorb or, or have in itself the infinite. That's what they would say. Okay? That's what they would say. All right. Let me, give you, let me give you a fairly decent, I think, definition. It's a long one, and we'll, we'll kind of talk our way through it in the next 10 minutes. All right. Here we go. The Christian, talking here about the biblical Christian, believes that there are two natures in Christ. For he reads or hears that the eternal Son of God became man through the Virgin Mary. Galatians 4, 4-5, John 1, 1-14. Plenty of Bible passages that show that God became man. Right? So far so good? All right. The Christian does not doubt the unity of the person. In other words, so you've got this... God and man in one person, not two people stuck together, not two persons stuck together like two boards, okay, like two glue together. It's not that, right? For he reads in Scripture that the one and same Jesus presents himself as the Son of Man and the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 13 to 17. The Christian entertains no doubt about the real communion of natures or a communion of attributes. You can go by either name. For Scripture tells him, Colossians 2.9, that the fullness of the Godhead, the Trinity, dwells not beside, next to, but within the human nature of Christ in his body. Okay, so far so good still? Are we okay yet? All right. Stop me when you stop me when 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 you get when I say something and you go, ha ha ha. The Christian, again, on the testimony of Scripture, believes that the Lord of glory was crucified, and that this gives to the suffering and death of Jesus its value. So God was crucified. In other words, God died. Okay? Romans 5.10, 1 John 1, 7. The Christian further believes on the testimony of Scripture that to Christ was given in time, as he was conceived, born, lived, in time, according to his human nature, this is important now, listen carefully, omnipotence, omniscience, and all other divine attributes. Let me read that again. The Christian further believes on the testimony of Scripture that to Christ, we're talking Jesus Christ, as He is on earth, right, was given in time during His life on earth, and according to His own human nature, omnipotence, omniscience, that he knows everything, and all other attributes. Matthew 28, 18, Matthew 11, 27, John 3, 34 to 35. So far, so good? All right. To the believer, to the Christian, the thought is foreign to his mind that these attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, which Scripture speaks, designate merely finite or great gifts. In other words, he has a lot of knowledge, but not omniscience. He has a lot of power. He has great power, more power than any other human being, but it's not 
omnipotence. See? To, to the true believer, that, that is wrong. That is foreign. Okay? We, we, don't, we don't go there. We believe Jesus in his flesh, in his body, has complete divine attributes. That the divine attributes are shared with his human nature. The communication of attributes. Okay? Well, I'm talking about Jesus walking around. Walking around, eating, drinking. Hey, how you doing? You know, talking, sitting, doing a sermon on the mount, crying on the cross. That's what I'm talking about. All right? So, so these are not just finite and great gifts. Let's go on. When Christ promises His church, and this is why I asked the question I did a minute ago. When Christ promises the church that He will always be with her, even to the end of the world, we think of this Savior as being present, not beside or outside or without His human nature. In other words, not, we think, not purely spiritual, which is the first thing we think of because He's invisible. Okay, we think of that. We think, well, how is Jesus with us wherever two or three are gathered? Well, he's, he's here, but He's spirit only, only spiritual. Believers don't think that way, even though we just did. <laughs> okay. But that's just why I bring up the this is why I bring up the point. Okay. Let me finish. Um, not without his human nature, but with and within his human nature. He ascribes, the believer ascribes to Christ, also according to his human nature, omnipotence, omniscience omnipresence. So, so far, I've got a little more to read, but, but the important point is that Jesus Christ is here with His body right now in this room. Physically. You cannot separate the soul and body of Jesus Christ because he's not dead. Jesus doesn't leave his body up in heaven and send his soul all over the place to visit his church or his believers. He doesn't do that. First of all, because he doesn't need to do that. And second of all, because, again, he's not dead. His soul and body are united eternally, forever. Okay, So wherever he goes, whether it's in the wafers and wine of communion, or whether it's in this room right now, or whether it's in your house when you're praying, or when you're, you're having a devotion with your family, or wherever you are, okay? Christ is not simply with you in spirit. Okay? He is actually really physically there. Okay? Okay? He is here with His body right now. How many of you walked in here this morning believing that? Didn't think of it. <laughs> I didn't. Well, I think if we're honest, we probably would all say that, right? Didn't think about it. They don't think about it. We, we, we tend to think, we tend to be like these guys, and we tend, because of our human nature, we tend to divide the attributes or natures. I'm going to put that word in there. Application of natures. We tend to divide these. And we tend to think of Jesus at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, visible, physical, all that, and we tend to think of Him in the Lord's Supper or in the room or in a worship service in a spiritual way. We tend to do that. 
Because again, he's invisible. Right? And so, well, obviously, he's here spiritually, but he's not here bodily. Wrong. Wrong. Let me finish, because uh, there's good comment coming up about finite and everything. When Scripture states that the Son of God appeared in the flesh to destroy through his activity in his assumed flesh, and through the assumed flesh the works of the devil, and to save mankind, 1 John 3, 8, Hebrews 2, the Christian understands this to mean exactly that Christ performs all his official acts, prophet, priest, and king, not beside, but in and through his assumed human nature. So it's not the God part only that lives a perfect life. It's not the God part only that suffers. It's not the God part only, or, or, or the man part only that, that suffers. It's not the God part only that does miracles. It's not the man part only that bleeds. It's not the God part only that uh, speaks great wisdom. It's not the man part only that dies. And you could go on and on and on and on and on. Even though, again, we tend to kind of divide things up that way. That's not biblical. Um, according to both natures. The Christian believes, uh, and believes this and repudiates the notion... Here we go. Here we go, folks. This is, this is, the, this is the capper. He re, the believer repudiates the notion that the finite is not capable of the infinite. We repudiate that. These guys believe that's the case, that the finite cannot contain the infinite. We completely disagree with that. And it's because of that teaching that the Romans have transubstantiation. And it's also because of that that the Reformed have representation in the Lord's Supper. So both transubstantiation in the Lord's Supper and uh, representation in the Lord's Supper come from this problem, come from this denial in the church, that the finite cannot contain the infinite. If you go all the way back to the conception, and there's a long section in here on the conception I won't get into right now, but, but if you go all the way back to the concession, conception, you have one of Mary's eggs that is, uh, as the scriptures say, overshadowed or overpowered, if you will, by the Holy Spirit. And the uh, body and soul of Jesus Christ, the human God-man, is created. From that moment, we, we, that's exactly what we have. We have the infinite God, second member of the Trinity, being contained by a one-cell cell. How in the world can 75% or more of Christians truly celebrate the virgin birth, actually the virgin conception, how can they celebrate that? Truly, really worship that. How can they celebrate God in man made manifest? How can, how can they celebrate Emmanuel, O come, O come, Emmanuel? How can they do that if they believe that the finite, that one cell, cannot contain the infinite, the second member of the Holy Trinity? You see? That's inconsistent, isn't it? That's crazy. This is why also the Reform, or not the Reform, the Romans, this is also why the Romans have to have Mary's mother also sinless. And this is why in the medieval church it was common to believe that there was a single line in Judah a single line in Judah that was always sinless, all the way back to Adam. 
Yes. I, I forget the Latin term for it, but it exists. Yeah. That's one of the explanations for the, the virgin birth, virgin conception, is that Mary was sinless, and her mother was sinless, and her mother, 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 okay? And it has to diverge. It has to go around Rahab the prostitute, right? Has to go around Ruth the Moabitess, the idol worshiper, right? Has to go around them. Has to go around Bathsheba, the adulteress. Has to go around them, which they somehow believe. And if you know a genealogical tree, you know certainly that's possible. You can go all kinds of ways. I mean, uh, 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 Charles, King Charles III, is a direct descendant uh, of uh, William the Bastard, uh, William the Conqueror, William of Normandy. But but when you say direct, well, there's direct and then there's direct. <laughs> you know, there's direct father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son. And then there's eh, mother, cousin, nephew. Mm. They're, they're definitely related. No two ways about it. Charles is a direct descendant of uh, William. No, no question. Okay. Uh, all right, fine. Okay, so his claim to the throne is good. But you know what? So am I. I'm a direct descendant of William of Normandy. I'm a direct descendant of William Wallace, Braveheart. Yeah, direct descendant. I'm a shirt tail relative of Winston Churchill. That means many times removed. And Lady Diana Spencer. And many others. So are you. You're probably all 1,252nd in line for the British throne or something like that. Okay, let me finish this real quick. Um... According to both natures, okay. Um, he repudiates the notion, yeah. For Scripture has convinced him that the Son of God did actually become partaker of flesh and blood. And therefore, the infinite has been united with the finite in one person. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Really. That's really what it's all about, folks, right there. It's this doctrine that, that Christmas is really all about. And a big chunk of Christianity don't get it. They just don't, they don't conceive it. They don't, they don't comprehend it even close. I mean, they don't even agree with it. What I just read to you, this guy says, is a short summary based on clear scripture passages contains the entire doctrine of Christ's person in the farthest reaches. And all of it is very intelligible to every, or should be, to every Christian. Now, it goes on, this particular book, goes on for... Well, about 250 pages on the communication of attributes. Martin Chemnitz, uh, uh, the, the guy who followed Luther, Second Martin, we call him, wrote a book called The Two Natures of Christ. But yay thick. You want to read something that'll uh, certainly stimulate uh, some amazing thoughts? Check it out. Martin Chemnitz, Two Natures of Christ. Amazing book. Great book. Fantastic book. Okay? It'll keep you uh, from falling asleep. It really will. You may not think so. You may start it out and you may go, oh man, this is boring. But boy, he gets into some cool stuff. And like he's like I say, you know, what does that mean? Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, blah, blah, blah. What does it mean? You know, and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's really cool stuff. It's, it's really great stuff. But I just thought I'd point that out this morning because, um, you know, you, 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 Christian churches used to, and out now not so much anymore, but Christian churches, of course, used to get big crowds of unbelievers or big crowds of unchurched anyway on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, uh, mostly Christmas Eve. Um, and, and, you know, what does it teach them? Uh, well, we sing Emmanuel, you know, come, come, Emmanuel. We sing, you know, God and man made manifest. We, 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 you know, so the hymns are right. <laughs> you know, the songs, the Christmas carols are correct, right? But who, who gives it a lot? Hmm, you know? Uh, so anyway, I just thought I'd point that out this morning because I, I thought uh, 
Okay. It would be fun for you to see that. Yeah. There are lots of people who say we're generally. Well, uh, it is it is a uh, it is a real presence in a, in the sense that it is physical, but it's also miraculous. And so it's not cannibalism on that on that count. And and he goes into that he goes into that in quite detail uh, the Lord's Supper the the real yes and 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 it's the whole body of Jesus in every piece of bread. It's not again people tend to think of a wafer or a piece of bread or however people do it, you know, they tend to think, well, that's, you know, that's a little pink, a part of his pinky, and that's part of his, you know, and that's part of his, you know, and that's a little, you know, this, and then, you know, picking him. No, no. That, that's that's uh, the, the false doctrine of Capernaism. Because when he talked about the readings last night, and I didn't really have time to get into it. I mean, I, I could have made a, I could have made a seven day, eight day, you know, come back every every evening for the whole week, and I will teach you about John chapter six. Now that would not have gone over very well. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, Capernaumic eating means uh, that um, this was the false teaching that uh, you you actually uh, chew uh, the the flesh of Jesus Christ. That is not the real presence. So you you might put it this way: if you want to if you want to give it some human. Um, or, or uh, dare I say, logical? Uh, you might say this: uh, the communication of attributes, the finite contains the infinite, and the infinite contains the finite, would give us the the uh, the real presence of Christ is a separate presence. In other words, it's it's a physical presence, but it's not the same physical presence that, let's say, Jesus on the cross. Okay. And, and he goes into a great deal of detail of why that is. Uh, one has to do with time and space and history and, and whatever. The other has to do with the uh, uh, omnipresence of God. Now, also remember this. Maybe this will help too. Also remember this, that while Jesus lived, again, while he's walking around on the earth, he has all the divine attributes, every single one of them. I mean, he could shoot thunderbolts, lightning bolts out of his finger. I mean, he could look at people and may fall dead. I mean, you name it. He could do anything, all right? He didn't, obviously. Why? Because he was in a state of humiliation. So he willingly pushed down his divine attributes. He did not make use of them. He could have. They were there. They were there just as much as there are there, are there now, uh, you know, in heaven next to on the throne of uh, God, you know, in the universe. No, no difference. But he didn't do that. So in the same sense, like he's in this room right now, he could appear if he wanted to. Because he's here physically. He could appear physically if he wanted to. He has decided in his own wisdom not to do that. Now, could he do it anywhere he wanted to? Sure. Could he appear to a Let's say there's a real good person, a real honest person, a real decent person who never heard the gospel, and he's on a desert island, and he'll never get off. He's going to die there. Could Jesus appear to him and tell him the gospel? Sure, absolutely. Do we have a promise that Jesus will do that? No, we don't. We have Jesus' command to us to find that guy on the desert island and tell him the gospel. So it doesn't always fit our logical understanding, right? The real presence is real, and it's physical. But it's not physical in the same way that Jesus was physical when he was here on earth. It's a, he, he, and you know, when he was passing through the doors, okay, on, on resurrection evening, see, he, there was a physical body, right? But it was a glorified body. We don't understand what that means, except in those examples. And it's the glorified body that is present in the real, real presence. It's the body that Jesus has now, but in a mysterious, miraculous way that we cannot fully explain. And to do transubstantiation is a wrong way to answer the question. And to do representation is obviously a wrong way to do the answer. And so we come up with stuff like in, with, and under. Remember that from your catechism days. 
is it, is it correct? Not really. You could do better, we could do better, but we never have. Okay? All right, let's get back to Exodus. We are in chapter 10, and we have read the first two verses of chapter 10. Let's read the rest of that section. It goes down to verse 11, and then we'll go back to the notes. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go tomorrow, I will bring locusts in your territory. They will cover your surface of your land so that no one be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, that's after the hail and everything. Uh, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled and your houses of all your servants and the houses of the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came upon the earth until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are, you, uh, who are the ones that are going? Moses said, We shall go out with our young and our old, our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds. We shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you, if ever I let you and your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Again, you see that Pharaoh is making, uh, he's negotiating. You know, uh, Moses is presenting God's uh, plan as ultimate, as, as uh, unconditional surrender, if you will. And Pharaoh is still thinking, oh, I can still negotiate with this guy. I don't, I don't have to surrender unconditionally. I can still hold out certain things. It's kind of like the Japanese after the first, you know, yeah, people wonder sometimes, they ask, well, how come, we understand Hiroshima, how come Nagasaki? How come? Well, if you study your history, you'll find out. After Hiroshima, uh, the Japanese government contacted the United States through the Swiss, of course, <clears throat> and, and said, okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll quit. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll quit the war if you, President of the United States, uh, Truman at that time, and Congress, whatever, if you guys and the rest of the nations that are fighting us, if you all agree to allow the emperor his divinity. Now, they did not ask, allow the emperor to stay emperor. They did not ask that. Did not, do not, they did not ask, allow the emperor to stay on his throne or whatever. They just ask, keep the emperor, you must declare that the emperor is divine. He's God. Well, if he's God, then he stays as emperor and he stays the head of the government. <laughs> Obviously. So the Japanese were pretty shrewd, you know. They, ah, you know, just give us this religious point. Eh, not a big deal. Well, it was a very big deal. And uh, you know, they, they were they were thinking of doing it one way or another, some of them anyway. And they, they, oh yeah, we should, yeah, okay, that's that's fine, that'll work, that'll work. And MacArthur in particular among others, but MacArthur in particular said, no, 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 people, you don't do that. You don't understand these guys the way I do. I live with these people. I understand these people. Some of these people are my best friends, and I, I understand their religion. I understand their way of thinking. I understand their culture. And you don't leave the emperor as divine. You leave the emperor as divine, you're going to have nothing but problems with these people, folks. Because the emperor could turn around tomorrow and say something completely different. And we could get in there and we could start having occupation forces and all of a sudden we'd find all our throats slit. So, uh-uh, no. And so they answered back and they said, no. No conditions. None. Not even that one. And there was only one. And so you have, I forget how many days, a week, 10 days, I don't know what it was. It was, you know, I think it was a week. So you have a week, the war goes on. A lot of people dying in that week. And then, of course, Nagasaki, a lot of people die in there, too. Over that one point, that one sticking point. That's what Pharaoh is doing. 
Pharaoh was saying, yeah, 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 okay, you can go, uh, but under my rules. You, you, you follow my rules. And God is basically saying through Moses, uh uh, unconditional, buddy. Unconditional. We leave, we leave on our terms, not yours. So that, that's what's going on here. All right, notes. Let's look at the notes, uh, page 48. So Egypt suffered tremendously from the great destruction of the hailstorm, yet Pharaoh continued to resist the will of God. So the eighth plague was announced. This time, God explained to Moses and Aaron quite clearly that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was for the future benefit of the children of Israel. These amazing demonstrations of God's power was supposed to make them understand better the great God and Lord who led them and asked them to serve him. So they're supposed to hang on to these ideas. They're supposed to hang on to this information. They're supposed to hang on to the memory of these things. Okay, and, and you know, Moses certainly is going to write them down. You know, Exodus hasn't been written yet, but he's going to, and, and that's supposed to help. But that's the point of, and again, that's clearly stated in the rest of the Bible many times. The point of Scripture is to give us uh, examples of uh, why God does what he does, how God works, uh, uh, and things like that. And we're supposed to know these things. We're supposed to remember these things. Okay? And, and this was a great problem with the Jews because they didn't. They forgot. They paid no attention to it. They didn't think when they're bringing idols into the temple, for example. They didn't stop and think. Should we do this to the God who wiped out Egypt with hail? Hmm. Probably not. Right? By the demonstration of God's power to destroy, they learned that the same power was also there for their deliverance, or at least they should have learned that. <coughs> By the account of Exodus from Egypt, the generation of Moses and Aaron, as well as the generations that would follow, could know from these records exactly who the one true God is. This is not somebody that you mess with. This is not somebody that you thumb your nose to. This is not somebody that you flip off. Hmm? But since, since the Exodus is denied, crossing the Red Sea denied, the miracles denied, not just in Moses, but miracles of Jesus denied, it's no wonder that, that people are thumb their nose at God if they even think there is a God. Why? Because even churches, the vast majority of churches, well, it, those miracles it really didn't happen that way. It really didn't happen that way. It wasn't like that. No, there really was no Exodus. There was no Joseph. You know, there was no land of Goshen. There was no, yeah, there was none of that stuff. There was no play, 10 plagues. There was no, no crossing the Red Sea. There was no man in the wilderness. No quail, you know, nah, there was none of that stuff. Not, not crossing over the Jordan on dry ground, pah, that's, that's a myth. Jericho, walls falling down, psh, that's a myth. See, this is by, by deconstructing the Bible, by deconstructing or destructing, destroying the records of Scripture, it's left people with no God, at least no God worthy of the name. That's what's happened. And it's the church's fault. Because the church has allowed this. And, and like I say, churches, most churches even teach in it nowadays. Which I, you know, I, I think is, uh, uh, I, I think it is uh, blasphemous uh, for the Mormons and, and for, for uh, liberal uh, churches, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, United Christians, you know, whatever, ELCA. I, I think it's blasphemous for them to even have Christmas programs, to even have Christmas services of any kind. It's blasphemous. They don't believe that stuff. They don't believe it. It's a lie. It's a big, fat, stinking lie. I wrote a big, long piece for the newspaper many, many years ago. First couple years I was here. Sent it into the newspaper. I said, here's the facts. And I quoted religions. I quoted seminaries and theologians from all these various churches that, you know, the, the, the virgin birth is bogus and bunk and no good. 
and, and the miracles of Jesus are bogus, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there were no uh, shepherds in their field at that time, and there was no angels singing, you know, uh, peace on earth to men, blah, blah, blah. And there was no wise men, and there was no this, and there was no that. And quotes, quotes, actual quotes from, from you know, and I sent it in, and I said, hey, run this. There's a great piece for you. Pulls the mask off of the churches in town. Because and I listed them, you know, you know, president of Presbyterian Seminary, you know, professor of whatever at uh, Methodist Seminary, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, call them up. Hey, did you get my piece? Yeah, yeah, I got a piece. Go, oh, well, are you going to run it? No. Well, well, so, well, you're not on our list of approved writers, you know, blah, 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 yeah. We don't have space for it. And yeah, we got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they knew they knew better. They don't want to run that. They don't want to have a riot in town. So, you know, but it, it is blasphemous. It really is. It, 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 it's really, really, really. You see these uh, advertisements in the newspaper or hear them on the radio or whatever. Hey, come to so and so's church. We're going to have this great Christmas cantata, you know, or whatever. Well, a bunch of unbelievers. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in two natures of Christ. They don't, they don't believe in any of that stuff. The problem is that few people know their own history and fewer learn from it. At the same time, if the one true God of history is not predominant in the facts of history, history itself becomes a fetish. That's all it becomes. I, I've got a lot of buddies, uh, a lot of, know a lot of people who are into history as much as I am but they don't see God's control of it. That, that's not their take. And so to them, it's just a hobby. To me, everything that happens in history, whether it was yesterday or a thousand years ago, is a very clear demonstration of God's direction of the world. That's the difference. How does God teach these lessons in the lives of believers today? How does God teach these lessons in the life? Well, we were just talking about one. We were talking about elections. That's a good, that's a good example. Okay? You know, and, and what we said, you know, we do we have to suffer. You know, uh, the Democratic Party and Republican Party, they have become big crosses for us to bear. They have, they have been laid upon us. God has allowed them to exist and allowed them to be completely corrupted, both of them to the point where, you know, we labor now. We, we, you know, we're under a very heavy burden. And, and um, um, that's a good lesson for us. Be careful what you vote for, you might just get it. You know, be careful. Be careful, okay? It, it, it's, you know, um, it's like some of the some of the founding fathers, you know. Hey, okay, we got this new country. What are we going to do with it? You guys wanted it. Now what? Well, it turned out the first program they they put in place, Articles of Confederation, they say it didn't work. Well, it didn't work. They didn't give it a chance to work. But anyway, that's beside the point right now. The point the point I'm saying is that they found out it was not easy. It's not, it's not simple to say, okay, we're going to have our independent country. Okay, well, how are you going to run it? Mm -hmm. It'll just kind of run itself. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they found out very quickly, very quickly, they found out that you kind of have to be a little bit of a tyrant. You kind of have to, you kind of have to tell boss people around. You kind of have to tell people what to do. And so one of the very first laws they passed is, hey, you can't talk against us. We're going to put together this new government now, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to shut up. You're going to take it, you're going to like it, and you're not going to complain about it. And you're not going to revolt. And so when some people revolted, what did old George Washington do? He took his troops, and he watched on them, and he shot them all. Ransacked their villages and took their tax money. And he said, let this be a lesson to you. We may have revolted against old George in Parliament, but you 
We're not going to allow you to do that to us. <laughs> okay. We can do it, yeah. You can't. Okay. We can have a revolution any old time we feel like it. You can't. You can't have a revolution against us, huh? No. We're better than George. We're better than Parliament. Now, were they any better? No. Were they any different? No, they were sinful human beings. But you know what the soul you know, you know the, the, the saying? The golden rule, the guy with the gold rules. Right? Or, or the other golden rule, the guy with the gun rules. And George had all the guns. Yeah. You know, it's like like slipped out. Joe Biden slipped out during the campaign back in <clears throat> back in 2020. Oh, you want a revolt, huh? He's just talking about the truth takers and all that, the oath takers and all those guys. Oh, you want a revolution, huh? Well, you know what? We got jets. We got atom bombs. You don't. So be careful. You start to start to start a revolution. It ain't gonna go like the last one. Because the last one, the British and the, the colonists were pretty much on the same. They were all bo both shooting muskets at each other. Try a revolution today. See what happens. See what comes pouring out of the gates at Fort Huachuca. It ain't going to be people with their 22nd rifles. No. It's going to be whatever tanks and armored personnel carriers I got with bazookas and rockets and everything else. And they're going to take you out real quick. Before you even think twice about it. The first thing they want to control is the military. Yes, sir. Obviously. Obviously. Well, no, not everybody well, does, but well, they should. People that don't have <laughs> <laughs> moving, on, moving on. Let's see if we can get some more space in here. Okay. Now, for the first time in this narrative, we read the word humble. This is what God's been after all along. Once a humble Pharaoh, once I get Pharaoh to understand you're not top dog. There's somebody above you, buddy boy. This is quite appropriate. Indeed, the first sin, the sin of which caused Lucifer to fall, was pride. Had Pharaoh simply opened his eyes, he would have been humbled before the Lord. You know, just, hey, recognize what's going on. Recognize these first eight uh, for seven plagues. You know, can you do that? Can any of your stinking idol gods do that? No. Well, what should this tell you? You're up against somebody who, who, who can, you know, bloody you up pretty good. Bow the knee, buddy. Hit the dust. By refusing to humble himself, Pharaoh distorted true reality. To humble oneself means to recognize who God is and who we are. It simply means taking a realistic view of our existence. That, that is so important, folks. And it's important across the board. We've got to take a realistic view of life. A realistic view includes God. A realistic view includes our mortal natures. A realistic view includes God controlling everything from every bird that falls from the sky to every hair numbered on your head. That's a realistic, that's, that's, that's not pie in the sky. That's not, that's not a spooky spiritualism. That's real. The realism of uh, existence is God controls everything. And He causes or allows everything. Everything. That's realism. And unless you really have that firmly ensconced between your ears, you're, you're just not being realistic. You're just not being realistic. Yes, God gives believers a certain amount of free will, you know. He says, well, I've got, you know, I've got you going from point A to point B. You want to go point A to point C, D, E, F, and then B, that's your business. But you're going to get to point B one way or another because that's what I want. Yes, sir. Question. I need you to help me understand this. I've always understood and I've always believed that God is in control of everything. Right. And then some people say, well, God is so good, then why did you let that just happen? They can stay. Yeah. And they always throw out to us the holidays. Sure. Is that 
why did God send I think God and let 400 or 4,000 German soldiers kill millions of Jews when all the Jews had to do was to rebel and they would have overran them but yet the Jews sat there passively and let all this stuff happen to them from the time they were kicked out of their homes and their stuff stolen and then put down a crane. So, and I can see their point, but I don't believe their point because my belief is God is in control. God is in control, absolutely. So you can, you can pick apart anything, sure. but where does your faith lie? Your faith right. has to lie in what you just said. Yeah. It allows everything right. to happen as right. Okay. We don't know why, but when people bring this up about Jews and, you know, there's people that say they're going to always be able to kill, but we all know that there is, or there have been, and why did they revolt? You, you, you answered your own question in a way. Well, yeah, be, because, because, be, be, well, be, but but really be, because that that was their that was their thinking at the time, and and uh, also when you're talking about that, you also got to remember uh, guilt, and and at that time, the the Jewish thinking was a lot of Jewish thinking was no different really than Christian thinking. You know, Christian thinking was the Jews said on Good Friday, "Let his blood be upon us and our descendants." You know. Uh, forever, basically, let let his blood, let Jesus' blood be upon our heads. That that's what they said, and so since then, Christians have said, "Well, <laughs> you you guys, I mean, come on, you you said, hey, you know, we're going to take the guff for this. We're going to we're going to take the the chastisement for this. Okay, whatever." Um, and and uh, the Jews themselves, you know, and not just about that, but about a lot of things. I mean, they understood. You know, their nation was taken away from them. Their temple was destroyed. Their capital city was destroyed. They were they were excised from the from the empire, basically. Uh, and then, of course, there's all the all the years between that. You know, hounded from nation to nation. All the expulsions. You know, uh, you know. We're, today we think of Ferdinand and Isabella as being famous for sending Columbus on his voyage. But Ferdinand and Isabella, the, the other thing they did in 1492, they expelled all the Jews from Spain. Or, or, or you had two choices in 1492, same year that Columbus left. Okay, same year, earlier in the year, earlier in the year, you had two choices in Spain in 1492. You could leave and go to Morocco. You couldn't go to France because France didn't want Jews. You couldn't go to Italy because Italy didn't want Jews. You couldn't go to Portugal. Portugal didn't want Jews. You could go down to Morocco and maybe the Arabs would let you in. Maybe. Or you could convert and become Christian. And a lot of them did. Which then led to, right after that, the Spanish Inquisition because those that converted stayed secret Jews. In other words, they lied. They said, oh yeah, we're Christian now, okay. And they went to Mass, and down on the dead of and then they went home, and they had the Sabbath, and they had, you know, they had their stuff. And they were found out, of course. And so they were brought before the Inquisition. What are you? Are you Jewish or are you a Christian? Well, I'm a Jewish Christian. <laughs> nope, sorry. So, so I mean, so, that's the answer to your question. I mean, you cannot blame God that people are stupid. I mean, really, are you going to blame God that Pharaoh was a jerk? Is it God's fault that God had to have ten plagues? Five would have been fine. Maybe one, maybe two would have been fine. You didn't, did, really, did, did God really need to do ten plagues? No, he didn't. But he knew that's what it was going to take. And he also wanted to because he wanted to give ten proofs to his own people what, what kind of God he was. Completeness. Well, you can say it that way, but but my point is, my point is, you can't blame God for what He's trying to do. He's trying to save the most possible people that He can. That's what He's trying to do. And you got to see that as the ultimate goal. And so, whether it, it and and for another thing, to two, the other thing, so so He is the first cause. But 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 another thing, you have to understand. Okay, fine. 
uh, uh, you know, let's say let's say it was six million. Okay, fine, six million. That's that's a that's a drop in a bucket, folks. That's a drop in a bucket. When you talk about Chinese, do you realize in some of the civil wars in China, 20, 30 million people were killed? Do you realize that? I mean, six million. Pah, 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 who cares? I mean, that's also awful brazen. We were the worst example of, of holocausting, whatever you want to turn that into a verb. We, we were the worst example of holocausting in the entire history of mankind. Excuse me? Uh, no, not even close. You're not even in the top 10. Ukrainians. Up to 15 million Ukrainians. Twice, over twice the number of Ukrainians died on, under Stalin's hand as Jews died under Hitler. Twice! And then some. I don't see any museum anywhere for Ukrainians. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see any special holiday anywhere for Ukrainian Holocaust. Africans, same thing. Indians, same thing. When, when, when uh, India was partitioned, uh, when it became independent, you know, they wanted to keep it all together. And then they had a war between the Muslims and the Hindus. 50 million people died. 50 million people. And they mostly killed each other. Until we had Pakistan on two sides and India in the middle. And then this became Bangladesh. That's another couple million people. Folks, it, it, all you have to do is Google, uh, you know, holocausts, small age, and you get a list. Ooh! And, and again, Jews don't even, they don't, they don't even come up to the top of the, uh, of the heap. So, so that, that's pride right there. That's, whoa, we're the most important. Well, who says you're the most important? Are you basing that on numbers? Well, then you're not right. Are you basing it on something else? Oh, well, yeah, we're still God's chosen people. Oh, well. There you go. Who's, who's the most bigoted, prejudiced people on the face of the earth? Huh? They come in second. They don't claim to be God's chosen people. I would say Louis Farrakhan's Nation of Islam and the Jews both. Because they're both kind of big God's people. <laughs> they deserve each other. <laughs> they really do. Okay, we're past our time. So. <clears throat> we'll pick it up uh, somewhere on page 48 and, uh, and verse 12 after we finish the notes on that section. So, Okay, let's close. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen.